Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming. Actually, some sessions, they start gently after lunch so you can digest, uh, but I warn you, this is not one of those sessions. So we're all Spring developers here, right? Um, we know how to do web applications with Spring. Uh, we have that great toolbox, and we know how to use it. And really, we wouldn't give it up for the world. A few years ago, I find myself being the project lead for a project to do a website. Uh, we needed plenty of integrations, we needed business logic, and Spring is great for that. Um, but for the customer to actually be able to use the website effectively, um, we needed something more. And we needed to give them a way to manage their website. So if, if our project had been the matrix, this would have been our blue pill, red pill moment. On one hand, we had Spring Framework, which is not a content management system. On the other hand, we had Magnolia CMS, uh, which is not a middleware framework. So we decided not to take either of the pills. Instead, we took both. So what we learned was that you can visit Wonderland and uh, still keep coding everything in Spring. Um, this talk is about how and why I took a both pill solution by building a spring integration for Magnolia CMS. So before we go further down the rabbit hole, uh, we should introduce ourselves. My name is Tobias Matson. I work for Magnolia, where I'm the lead developer of the spring integration. And I've used the spring framework since 2005. And I'm Daniel Lip. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I actually started to work with Java a long time ago in, with JDK 1.1.3. And I confess, I openly confess here, I am not an experienced Spring user. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but maybe that might change. Now, during my career, I most of the time had to work with Java E, plain Java E. But what I appreciated a lot was all the good influence Spring development had on Java E. So it's a lot simpler nowadays than it used to be before. So that's really cool. And as I'm not a Spring expert, so it's obvious during that talk, Tobias will focus on all the spring things, and I'll uh, explain you the CMS stuff. So, uh, well, we both work for Magnolia. That's an international open source uh, vendor. Its headquarters is in Basel, Switzerland. That's, that's where it was founded in 1997. And, well, our CMS is called Magnolia CMS. And as I just learned in the keynotes, well, it's 10th anniversary of spring, of Groovy, and of Magnolia, the CMS. It's 10 years around now, and uh, next to the headquarters, we have now a beautiful office in Miami. So that's where we re represent it in the States. Another one in Czech Republic, in China, and Spain. So we're kind of spreading out around the world. Um, so this CMS uh, has about, well, actually more than 5,000 installations worldwide. We don't know the precise number because it's hard to track with the open source thing. We, we just uh, have a rough idea. Um, but what we know is that there is uh, 200 enterprise customers, and those uh, are spread around in around uh, 100 countries. And let me explain um, some details here with using these customers. I'm not a marketing guy, but both are, we are not, as Tobias mentioned. Um, so I'll focus on the key features there. And if we pick uh, IATN, so internationalization, for your website, you might have to run it in tons of languages. In the case of uh, Sony Entertainment in the app right there, their SingStar web page is uh, in 20 languages. So uh, if you don't have a good uh, internationalization support, it might be very cumbersome to uh, maintain these things. So the structure and everything of the websites is just hosted once, and only the translations um, are separately kept. Then talking about security, you might guess US Navy has strong needs there. Don't, they don't want to anyone to access content which is not uh, you should not see right uh, EIDS I don't know if, whether you know what's that that's basically the European sibling to the NASA so they're doing aircraft things space uh, systems stuff like that so there again they're really keen on uh, security and obviously US Navy did a strong uh, security test penetration test and all these things uh, before they choose the system and last but not least we quickly talk about scalability. Um, so the MPC in the middle up there, that's uh, the largest broadcaster in the Middle East. So tons of uh, television um, 
Gen sorry, channels and stuff like that, well, they get generate millions of hits, and obviously if the system wouldn't stand that, it would not be that a good experience. And last but not least, as we are in IT, I think everybody knows about Atlassian. And let me tell you a short story. So when the guys evaluated uh, Magnolia, they were pretty curious. They said, okay, um, let's just try it out and see how it scales. And it was actually like two years ago, 1st of April. Most of you guys might remember the um, Angry Nerds, April's full joke. So the website hosting that game, that was created with Magnolia. All the rest of their site was uh, with their old content management system, and then they started to advertise this campaign. And what happened on the 1st of April, and that's, that's really true, is they got tons of hits. Their real system, the website, it dived, and our system stayed up. So that's why they said, okay, that's cool. It's scaling for, enough for our needs, uh, so that's why they went uh, for Magnolia. So enough of uh, this part. So if you feel like tweeting, that's the hashtag we recommend you to use. Um, if after the talk there's open questions, of course there will be a question and answer session. We have a small table at Exhibit Hall. You can uh, show up anytime or check out online. We have an additional slide at the end of the, the talk where you find some more links. If there's anything else, just ask. So back to the Alice in Wonderland story with the pills. <laughs> Okay, so what if we had gone with only Spring? Then we would have had all the tools we required. Uh, we wanted Spring MVC, we wanted Spring Webflow, uh, and it would have been much easier for us to do integrations, all the integrations that we needed. Um, but we would have had to develop content management features ourselves, some kind of content management the customer would have required. Um, we would have had to invent things like controlling who can edit what page, um, how to serve pages in multiple languages. Um, and on top of that, we would have had to design a user interface, and we would have had to invest a lot of time in making a proper uh, user experience. And then that would have led us to uh, eventually having to do image manipulation tools, like cropping tools and so on. And that wasn't really what the project was about. <coughs> So had we gone with only Magnolia, we would have got all these features for free, but we wouldn't have had the uh, toolbox that Spring is. Um, integrations would have been really, really painful. And uh, we were all Spring developers, and we wanted that effectiveness and uh, to be able to release in time. So <clears throat> of course, we could have kept the two separate, one machine running Spring with all the integrations, and one machine running the CMS, and then just iframed in the two. But um, <laughs> we're not supposed to do that anymore, right? Um, it would have been a disaster, SEO-wise, and it really would not have given the customer the flexibility they needed, because we wanted them to be able to configure and customize the functionality of the Spring app directly from the CMS. We did not want to give them two user interfaces or admin console. So that's how Blossom was born. Blossom is a module for Magnolia, and it integrates Spring and Magnolia in a very Spring-centric way, and it abstracts a lot of the inner workings of the CMS, so that's just seamless and just works from Spring. So the module is an extension to Spring MVC. Uh, it's an annotation-based API. And the idea is that you just use these annotations directly on your controllers, and Blossom will automatically make them uh, available within the CMS. So this allows the editors creating pages to use your controllers as building blocks and assemble them as they compose and create pages. So before Tobias explains how he could hook in the system, this is a CMS in a nutshell crash course, two minutes. <laughs> so it's very easy. You have incoming requests. This request gets mapped to certain content. You find the associated template that's used to render it and stream it back. That's about it, right? Template obviously defines uh, where certain data is placed, uh, um, styling, and all kind of things. That's the, the essentials of any CMS. And in that, that case, Tobias used it to do? Yeah, what I did is I changed the template completely. Um, and brought in Spring MVC. So 
um, <clears throat> the requests are mapped to content, and the content is associated with a controller in Spring MVC that will render that content. And that's a plain Spring MVC controller. We did not want to do anything else. So the only thing you do to make this possible is you use the template annotation, you give it an ID. This is the ID that we embed in the content to identify the controller. And we're also giving it a title so, it, so that it has a name in the CMS user interface. And in most projects, you will have one page template per type of page or per different layout that you have. So Magnolia divides pages into areas. And within these areas, you place components. Um, this provides a nice balance of flexibility and control for everyone who works with the CMS. You can assemble them any way you want. Um, in Blossom, these areas are controllers themselves. Uh, you define them with the area annotation. And they're then nested classes within the page template controller. So that means that the area is right in the code where the page template is. So it's in the same place. And the components, they're classes of their own. And we use the same annotation. And we are also giving this an ID for embedding it in the content. And the format of the ID is, first it's the module that installs the template. Then there's the string components. Uh, that's the only thing that differentiates a component template and a page template. Otherwise, they're exactly the same. The views are resolved using standard view resolvers. Magnolia supports both JSPs and FreeMarker. And for both of these, we provide tags and directives that are used to, uh, to render areas on the pages and components within areas. So this means that it's the views that dictate where on the page uh, the areas go, where the components go. Now, here, here's an example of both in FreeMarker and JSP for rendering an area. And we actually prefer FreeMarker primarily because uh, with FreeMarker it's possible to load the file from any source. So it could be on the file system or in a database or even on the class path. With the JSPs, they have to be in the web application archive. Also, we just find FreeMarker to be a lot more powerful, more expressive. You can do more with fewer uh, constructs. So it's a much neater syntax. So now it's about time to give you a quick overview about the technical stack of Magnolia. So it's completely based on Java, probably not a surprise here. Um, there's a bunch of technologies we're using. JCR, Java Content Repository, I'll get in details in a second. Wadin as well. See, we just use the server API. We have no EJB, so basically, as Spring Apps have, Tomcat is, for example, enough to host such, such a system. And our UI is HTML5 compliant. And as Tobias just uh, pointed out, for example, if you uh, see the templating area, you can actually uh, exchange. Oh, write your own templating if you're not happy with either of the existing ones like GSP or free market. It's really, there's many, many places where you can hook in, where you can configure the system. So talking about Java Content Repository, I have no clear idea. How many of you guys know about Java Content Repository? Okay, yeah, that's a not few. too much. Yeah, few, yeah. Well, it's, if you're working with traditional applications, you probably don't need it. So that thing was precisely made for um, storing content. So uh, in, uh, in the case of uh, a CMS, it's web pages, sub pages, binaries, whatever, all these kind of things. And uh, yeah, that's where, what it's designed for. So it was an obvious choice for us to use. The really cool thing is it comes with a reference implementation, Check Rabbit, Apache Check Rabbit, uh, which is not just a kind of a, to sorry, <coughs> a toy thing, but it's really, uh, it's production ready. We run our installations with that repository, and it, uh, it works fine. So if you see on the right-hand side this, this graph, that should explain that JCR um, is a hierarchical structure. You have nodes and properties. You can node, uh, nest nodes, 
uh, within each other, and then I have properties at the end. It's very much like a file system, right? You have folders, another folder, that one folder you have two files, and the next one probably ten. So that's how um, JCR is structured. In that example, you could imagine that on the left-hand side, it would be your landing page for a website. Or, and if you refer to the, pat sorry, to the pattern that Tobias explained, so the um, page area component thing, next level could be two areas you use, and uh, the third level would be then components. And you see, for example, in the, with the areas, the one would have three properties, the other one, no additional one. So really, really flexible. Talking about flexibility, here in that case, you see there's a persistent manager, and it provides um, different options to store your data. You could just go for the file system or in memory for certain cases. The default is obviously using a database, a relational database. And the system comes with a bunch of configurations. So you could use uh, well all the major vendors, Oracle, MySQL, there before development, for example. It's uh, really well abstracted. So at that point of the presentation, normally people would ask, so why didn't you go for a NoSQL solution? Well, because JCR is precisely made for what we needed. And it's actually, um, you can see it as a combination of best of two worlds, file system and database. And then there's some sugar on it. Let me just explain with a few examples. So for example, locking. You can have locking. You can lock content where someone is operating on. Others um, won't get in like a file system thing. It's role-based security, so it can precisely define which role can access a certain path of your, of your website, for example, which is not as easy in a, in a database. The hierarchical structure was already mentioned. Then from the other side, if you see it with the database view, it's, it can be strongly typed, but you can also configure it to be schemeless. You can have queries on those structures, full text search, very nice things. And uh, some of those uh, sugar features that are um, not present in a, in a file system or in the database, for example, the versioning. On a website, if you, might, uh, if you change something and you accidentally used the wrong image, you might be happy if the old version is in the repository, you just can restore it rather than try to figure out what was served before. And the last feature I want to mention, very important, is uh, that event notification observation. We'll come to that later. But in a nutshell, you can have your system immediately be notified when someone changes a certain path of your structure there. So if for a configuration, so someone reconfigures the system, and it will immediately pick up no restart, uh, no deploy. So as this structure, may, uh, a this structure is on no, the hierarchy thing is kind of unstructured. You can add as many properties as you want. When you fill in the data, when you guide someone to fill in the data, you need um, some kind of constraints. So that where we typically use dialogues. I think that's an obvious choice. So you label the things, the, the properties the guy should enter, and then you have certain uh, fields that kind of uh, well, support the entering for a certain data type. So like you see it in that example, date, obviously a date choose is a good thing there, stuff like that. So at that point, I quickly would like to demonstrate a few things. If you could switch, that's cool. Oh, very nice. Perfect. So this is just a showroom application. I'm in a page editor. And it's just an example. So uh, yeah, a, a file upload could be something like that. It opens the finder. Could just as well drag a file just to it. Um, another example, well, selections. Something I forgot to mention. In JCI, it's actually possible that a certain property has multiple values. So for such a property, it would be handy to have a control like that, where you say, OK, this property is populated with these two values. And last but not least, for editing support, there's a bunch of controls. And some of them actually support syntax. So here in the HTML code, you get actually um, support. It's pretty handy. And these controls, the dialogue itself, and actually, well, the whole uh, administration interface, this, uh, this application here where you administer your content. They are um, created based on Wadin, shown on the previous slide. If you could switch back, please. Thanks a lot. Um, 
So Wadin, I think there is a bunch more guys that know about Wadin. If you could raise your, your hands. Only you guys? Oh, that's good. Well, um, so Wadin is uh, based on grid, but it keeps the state on the server side. So uh, the cool thing there, or the main reason why we choose it was that it frees you from writing those transfer objects to keep the client side state in the browser in sync with your, with your server side. But this remoting, that's, that's completely encapsulated by, by Wadin. Of course, that's not the best choice if you expect 2 million users for a system. But we are, here we are talking about the administration system there. And, well, if it's a 1,000 editors, that's still fine. Well, you can keep that session on a state. There is a, it's a component-based UI. Well, no surprise, but that's, of course, handy if you want to provide some uh, kind of framework support, what we actually do. Uh, well, with Grid, you get all this uh, incaps uh, hiding of the browser differences. That's very, very comfortable. We try to support as many browsers as possible. Uh, there is actually third-party libraries, quite a bunch of them, with really advanced uh, elements. So, for the example, for our UI for this dialogues, we obviously didn't have to write any wanting component. They were just there. We just plugged them uh, together. And yeah, we could really develop at fast pace. One more thing I want to mention there, if you compare it with a plain grid, this was actually a first, our first choice when we were going for the new version of our CMS. Uh, with our problem with grid was, or the main problems were like the compilation time. We support uh, multiple browsers, multiple languages. So we had tons of iterations of compilation and you blocked for, I don't know, 15 minutes and stuff like that. With Vardin, if you just change two elements in your UI, just move the order and stuff like that, there's no recompile. So that's much better than also testability. With Grid, you always have these Grid test cases, which are pretty hard to set up and slow in execution. With Vardin, you basically have a kind of a server-side representation of your button, let's say, and a client-side representation. You don't have to test this remoting in the client-side representation because that's provided by the framework. So we just use that server-side button for a test, and that can, can be a, a plain JUnit test. So where to summarize there, we're really happy with the choice. Um, it's a very efficient way of uh, writing UIs if you don't want to do too much JavaScript. And as we are Java freaks, that was our choice here. Um, so I started with the dialogues. Let's see how uh, Tobias used that technique to create dialogues with Blossom. Right, so the CMS had all these goodies, all these fields that we wanted to use. Um, we looked at it and we decided that no, we're not going to leave the controllers. We are still going to do this directly from Spring MVC. And the way that we came up with was that we would add methods in the, directly in the controllers for each of the tabs within the dialog. And then using this Fluent Builder Style API, uh, we could easily create and populate the dialogues with fields in this very, very compact syntax. Um, and especially while developing, we could use hot code replace, change it, test it immediately, uh, very short uh, turnaround times. Um, so that worked, worked very well. Um, and these builders that we're using they're not actually composing the uh, Vardin uh, user interface directly. Uh, what they're doing instead is they're building a definition model with uh, plain POJO classes. Uh, and we're describing what the fields should look like and how they should behave. And then based on this definition model, we're building the Vardin user interface. <clears throat> So here's an example of a dialogue with, um, well, it's a, it's a template with a simple dialogue for just setting the title. So the dialogue looks like this. And in the view, we access the content with a plain JSP EL expression. Uh, so we're actually wrapping or exposing the content in JCR as a Java util map to make these expressions simpler. Um, the areas can also have dialogues. So here's an example of an area that has a heading and uh, a way to uh, set the width of the border. And in the view, we're accessing it in the same way. And here we're looping over the components within the area and rendering those. 
Um, in this example, we have a component which adds a text field and a rich text field, which looks like, looks like this. And in the view, we're decoding the content of this field because it saves HTML markup to the repository. And by default, we escape everything that we print out in the views. Uh, we don't want to do that because this field saves it as HTML, otherwise it would be uh, decoded one time too many. And uh, we have this wrapper there for security. That's why it's there. Um, here's <clears throat> an example of a YouTube component that allows you to embed a YouTube video right on any page. And what I want you to note here is that in the request mapping method, we're passing in a node. This is the node in the JCR. So directly into this method, we can uh, read the content. And here we're getting the video ID that's entered in the dialog. And yeah, the view is pretty simple. So I'd like to show you this one. So here in Magnolia, do I have to reload it? Yeah. So here in my um, main area, I can just add a new component. I get a list of the, the components that I can use. Can choose the YouTube video, enter a video ID, and it pops up right in the uh, uh, right on the page. And I could go back, change it anyway. So that, that's how easy it is to use these uh, Spring controllers to uh, compose your pages. So this was an example of how to use the dialog to configure not just the content that the controller should display, but also what it sh should do. So for instance, you can use this to uh, configure how many items to fetch from a back office system and display, or how many uh, tweets to fetch, and the search query to search on Twitter uh, based on the content on the, on the page. <clears throat> So one of the reasons why we decided to split the dialog into uh, one method for each tab is to allow you to reuse tabs across components and across page templates, because it's pretty common that you have similarities there, and we don't want to repeat ourselves. So here's an example of a abstract class, uh, which perhaps all of the page templates in a project can inherit from, and they will all get this uh, meta tab for filling in the meta information. So because these dialogues are created using this API, we can do some interesting things with the dialogues. Uh, for instance, we can uh, populate it based on what we get back from calling a web service, or uh, we could customize it based on where on the web page it's used, uh, like maybe a checkbox for whether it's supposed to be present in the navigation, which makes sense for page pages that are uh, directly under the start page, but if it's deep in the hierarchy, we're not going to want to even show the option to the editors. Or we could customize it based on who the user is and present different options based on who the user is. So, and to make this safe, uh, the dialog support validation uh, with the same builder API, and this becomes especially useful when you're configuring what the component should do rather than what it should display. And speaking of control, you can customize where these templates can be used. So for instance, this article template can only be used in the article section of the website. Um, you could also here limit it to who can use it, yeah, for instance. So many components are designed to fit into certain areas of the pages. Like style-wise, they would not fit anywhere else. Uh, like banners should go in the banners area. So using this annotation, you can sp 
specify exactly which components the editors will be able to put into that area. Um, and here we're referencing the classes directly because otherwise you would have to repeat those string IDs. And uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't want that. So another really useful feature is area inheritance, which means that components will be inherited through the website. So typically you have a header and a footer. And you don't want to populate those areas on every page that you create, but you still want them to be configurable. So you don't want to hard code them into the views because you can't change them. So what we do instead is we add them to the first page, the landing page, the root page in JCR. And they will then be inherited and cascade down the uh, page hierarchy. So you, can, you have them only one, at one place, you change them at one place, but it affects all the pages. So how does this work? <clears throat> The way it works is that when Magnolia starts up, when Spring starts up, we uh, scan uh, for annotated controllers, for all of those that are annotated with that template. And we do this using uh, bean post processors and really interrogating the bean definitions. Um, and so we find all the controllers, and they're managed by uh, a slightly customized dispatcher servlet. And this dispatcher server is not configured in WebXML. It's not accessible from the outside. So there will never be a request coming from the outside which reach one of these controllers. Uh, instead, they're uh, executed only when the request comes in, goes through the rendering engine in Magnolia. And then when the rendering engine hits a piece of content that's associated with one of these controllers, then it will fake a forward or an include request onto this dispatcher servlet. <clears throat> and it does this by faking the response and request objects. So that way we can target a specific controller, which gets executed, and we then render its view directly into the response object. So there is no iframes. So before we go further, let me quickly explain two things. So to be as mentioned, Blossom is implemented as a module. Um, so in Magnolia terms, the module is not a super complicated thing. Our module mechanism doesn't, uh, based on OSGI, there's no match with class loaders. It's as simple as a, a char, a char file containing your code, your resources, and a descriptor. And with that descriptor, you tell um, what other modules you are depending on. And the, we do that in, so that the system, when starting up, can uh, calculate the, the order of modules you have to install it. Because it might, if you depend on a certain module, you assume that this module has been installed, has a, its configuration set, and you might want to fire, modify this configuration, so you have to make sure that it's installed first. Um, with that simple approach, uh, it's a, uh, we have the big advantage that you can easily scale down your system. Right? You can throw out all the things you don't need. So a minimal Magnolia installation can be very slim. But yours, uh, you make sure that all the things you need, they are still there. So even your web page, um, ed create editions like Blossom, they're always packaged as module, and you spread it to all the instances uh, you want to use them. This is a very powerful um, mechanism. And the other thing that was just mentioned was like the filtering and the rendering. And uh, let me explain this one here. So the upcoming requests goes to the Magnolia filter chain. In the Magnolia filter chain, all the dark green filters, they are filters provided by the system. So as an example, well, really, really early in the, in the filter chain, you want to make sure that the security is granted so that guys are actually, or actually allowed to access a certain content. Cache is a very important one uh, in the CMS context, especially the landing page. There will be millions of hits. If you can serve them from the cache, it keeps really traffic low on your system. If you can't do that, you might be doomed. So cache is a configurable, for example. You can put exchange it, put it in your, your own cache. That gray thing, that's where you typically would place your custom filter. And last but not least, in that filter chain, once you really came to the rendering, that's where the, finally the rendering is then triggered. 
Right. So the rendering engine is really very flexible. You can modify it, you can add filters. Uh, and with, with Blossom, we were easily able to change this to, to use Spring, Spring the way we wanted and do all these cool things. Here's a pretty standard Spring controller for uh, viewing a contact form and then handling the submission of the form. And if it validates, we respond with a redirect, which goes to a thank you page. And only by adding the uh, template annotation, this stuff is going to work. And nobody's shouting, so I shout, stop. Hang on, there's a problem. What Tobias just explained won't work. You would get something like that. That's just because uh, when the once response is committed, you're really limited in what you can do with it. You can't do any redirects any longer. You can set headers and stuff like that. So I'm pretty sure you had to work around this problem. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's surprise. <laughs> um, so in order to handle this, uh, we I guess we could have had two controllers where one would be accessible from the outside world and that would handle the form submission. So we would submit to it instead. Um, but what if the form did not validate? How would we be presenting the validation errors? There would be no good way to do that. And it really did not feel right to split that controller up because you really want those two methods with each other in the same class. So we worked on that and we came up with the solution that I call pre-execution. So what we do here is we take the uh, controller that wants to handle the form submission and we execute that first and we look at what it returns. So if it returns a redirect, then we output the redirect immediately and we skip page rendering completely. We don't do anything else. But if it doesn't, then we proceed into the page rendering, we render the page, the areas, and once the rendering engine hits that component, it doesn't execute the component again, it just executes the view right there where it's supposed to be with its validation errors. Uh, so in the middle of the response. And the way this works is that we simply add an extra request parameter that we pass in with the form submission and we, it contains the ID of that exact piece of content. We have a tag lib for that, of course. Um, so with Blossom, you're able to use Spring MVC, as always. You don't have to leave uh, Spring to do any of this stuff uh, the way I liked it. Um, and your authors are able to use the controllers, assemble them on, them on pages, really build the website as they want to, uh, and mix in the functionality that you've given them through the controllers. And uh, you get to do the user interface directly in the controller, and you can access the content directly in the request mapping method. It's exactly like Spring should be. Um, so I like to say that Blossom is Spring MVC with content. Now, a tough requirement was to use Spring Webflow. Um, this was a travel agency website that we were building. Uh, we had integrations to, uh, uh, for booking airline tickets, hotel rooms, and all this. And on every travel agency website, there is these booking flows that you go through. And Spring Webflow is, of course, the killer app for that. Um, for us, it was an immediate choice. We're going to use Spring Webflow. We've got to make that work. Uh, so thanks to pre-execution, we were able to add a controller that would run Spring Webflow, a simple flow controller. Um, we could embed it inside the page and use form submission, so that would just work. Um, however, <clears throat> as you've all seen on travel websites, the Spring Webflow sits directly on the landing page. So all the users coming into the site access that page first. And this this uh, Webflow was pretty heavy to start out. There was lots of preparations to do. Uh, and every visitor would trigger a Webflow and then they would just navigate away. So the performance was horrible. It used a lot of memory, lots of CPU, and it was all a waste. Um, so what we came up with was simply to use a 
tiny slim down controller on the landing page that would submit into Spring Webflow. And we had added Spring Webflow on that second page in the middle of the page. Uh, so that solved the performance issues. And while working on it, we realized, okay, if we can do redirects this way, we could probably do it within the Webflow as well. So we figured out that you can redirect between the view states in Spring Webflow. So we could put different steps of the flow on different pages in the CMS. And that allowed the customer to add uh, instructions for every step, like instructions that make sense for uh, a particular step in the flow right there on the page. And they could change it whenever they wanted or fine tune it or add uh, custom banners or links to campaigns. Um, the next step of the project was to deploy this stuff at scale. And Magnolia is pretty fantastic when it comes to scalability, as Daniel will tell you about. Yeah, I remember when I showed you the customers, so I said like for Atlassian, for example, uh, or the MBC customer, scalability was really an issue. And so how do we achieve that uh, great scalability? Well, the first thing is, uh, you see on the left-hand side, we have author, an author instance, and on the other side, we have public instance. Like small PHP systems, for example, they don't do this separation. They, everybody's operating on the same instance, right? You do changes, and they're going to be live in the Internet on the very next moment. So that's actually one motivation to split it. We don't want that. In an enterprise context especially, you don't want that. You want to, have, uh, to time it when it should be published. The other great advantage of this feature is actually that on the author instance, well, it's your authors that are working. This is an internal thing that might be thousands of them. It's fine. It's behind your firewall. And all the traffic they are generating is not affecting your website, which is live. So this is kind of a staging environment built in the system. On the other side of the firewall, those public instances, well, you can have uh, multiple of them. That depends on your need, right? And you just put a load balancer in front of them. When a guy tries to access the web page, load balancer decides on which instance he will end up, and he's fine. If you see, if you see there, all of these instances, or each instance has a um, dedicated JCR repository. So uh, there's uh, basically no limits. Put as many public instances as you want, and you'll find it. Many customers actually put it in a VM. So the whole thing, the Magnolia, JCR, and stuff like that, if they know about upcoming peaks, they have a campaign and stuff like that, they scale it in by adding more public instances. After that, they will probably remove it. So the mechanism to put the changes to the public <coughs> instances, that's what we call activation. And obviously, we need to track the delta. So in, in our author system, we know this is the state which is on the public instances, and this, those are the changes. People can say, I want to publish this change. Now, it depends, like in an enterprise uh, version of our system, you can have a workflow. You might want to have a four-eye controls before those changes go live. You might want uh, to time it. So your campaign starting in two days at noon, and it's weekend, so nobody has to be around. The system will take care, will uh, activate. Um, this is how that setup works, and yeah, as you said, that's how we scale. And I'm sure for Blossom, <coughs> you made use of that yeah. structure. So this drastically simplified uh, sketch shows how we did it. So we had a number of public instances and one author instance. And in each of these, we're running the Blossom module. And on top of that, we designed the module for uh, our project. Again, a module is just a jar file with an XML descriptor. Um, and what's important is that this module would run on multiple instances. There are always at least two, one author and one public. So the code had to be written to be uh, ready for clustering from the start. And that's actually pretty good, because uh, adding support for clustering uh, in retrospect can be quite tricky. Um, we came up with a model where we would use a back-end application both for as a user interface for the people working at the travel agency, handling orders and the customers, etc. Um, incoming invoices and all of that stuff. 
Um, and the integration that we chose was plain old spring remoting because it's just so simple and we owned both ends of the communication so there was no need to go for something formal like SOAP web services or defining a REST API. Uh, just plain spring remoting. Um, after the website went live, um, the, the uh, customer, the users were able to uh, keep the website up to date easily. Uh, we never had to do a deployment cycle for simple things because they could change the pages. Um, for us as developers, however, we, we learned that we had to be able to deal with change, uh, do changes without restarting, and basically deal with things that we had not expected. So the filter chain in Magnolia is configured in the JCR. The JCR is not just for web content. Uh, so in, the, in extreme cases, we could do changes in here. Um, there is like changing caching configurations on the cache filter. Uh, there's even an IP level security filter in there that you could change. Uh, so if something was really, really needed to be fixed, I mean, this was like the last resort. And we devised a way that we could use the same kind of idea for bean definitions in Spring. So in, in the XML files, you could use our custom namespace and define observed beans, where observed means that we're uh, going to load the bean from the JCR, basically marshalling it. And when someone changed it through the user interface in Magnolia, uh, we would just replace that bean because it was protected by a proxy, so we could do that transparently and no other bean in the application context would uh, know that it was going to be changed. And you can even change the uh, implementation class. So replace the implementation of the dis discount service uh, live if you uh, have that requirement. Um, another thing that we did was vanity URLs. So when they had a campaign and they created a page which was deep in the page hierarchy, uh, we added a mechanism where we could configure vanity uh, URLs in the JCR, uh, basically a URL rewrite rule. And we used that actually to fix uh, like 404 problems that we found only after deploying, uh, which was a neat trick. And we also had the opportunity, thanks to Magnolia, to change a bunch of the resources, uh, even like the CSS, the JavaScript, and even the views you could, we could change because the free market views, as I mentioned, uh, you can load those from a database. So those are uh, stored also in the repositories. They, they can be changed there and have inf uh, effect immediately. So when the customer had ideas like, uh, we're gonna do a Christmas theme on the front page, uh, we could easily hack that in as a temp temporary solution without having to uh, release a new version and redeploy everything. So Daniel, what did we win with this? So well, Tobias showed us how uh, you can visit Alice in Wonderland and uh, while the story continues, just uh, because well, there's um, ongoing development of both, on both sides, on the Spring side, obviously on the CMS side, in that case Magnolia, the module is maintained, so it's just about to be released for our latest version. And uh, while well, that means that you can benefit from all the new improvements there, and I wanted to quickly show you a few things there. If you could switch again one more time. So, if you, yeah, thanks. Um, if you've seen uh, other CMSs, there's tons of them that have really complicated UI. There's so much functionality in that it's. Uh, People are, uh, developers are having a hard time to put it in the system and people still can find it. So actually, for our current release, we took three complete approaches to um, refactor the UI, then we threw it away again and again, so we ended up with a, th a third attempt. And then you see it's uh, kind of inspired by uh, mobile devices. Because we, what we really liked uh, with the mobile devices, 
next to the flat design, which is now Apple, Apple copying from us, but well, <laughs> shit happens. Um, it's uh, simplicity. It's everything where you act would expect it. So the one thing I quickly wanted to mention is those three icons. We call them th Trinity icons, though it's, uh, it's the app launcher. But whenever you want to, st uh, to launch an app, you just go on that thing. This is the Pulse. So this is a kind of built-in messaging hub. If you, for example, have the workflow installed and someone has a change, and well, obviously a group of people should review it, they will get the message there, some things to review. If there's a problem in the system, you get the message there. And that, last but not least, this is favorites. So as you might have seen, um, well, UL is constantly updated depending on where you navigate in the system. So to any places in the, in the application you have to visit frequently, you could just uh, create a favorite, click on it, jump on it, so it's an easy way to, to customize this system. Let me get quickly back to the applications, well, the apps. So what we actually build is an app platform here. Those are the apps provided by the system. Um, most of the behavior of the apps is configured. So when you install that system, you can configure to your needs. You need an additional column in a, to display web, um, certain properties for a web page. You just configure it to be there. You can uh, add new apps without writing a single line of code, just with some configuration um, tricks. And you could write completely new apps using all the widgets, for example, that are provided by Wadin. So uh, charting, for example, if you want to observe memory in the running systems, there's actually a lot of app development going on. We have lots of partners, and they are all heavily now implementing apps. So we are really ourselves uh, um, wondering what would show up. And so it's not only inspired for mob mobile device, but it's even designed to work on mobile devices. So let me quickly show you, and I hope this works. Yeah, so you might have seen such a device. Let's hope that works. Come on. So it's already green there. I think that's just a delay. Oh yeah, there we go. So I can start the apps there. Pages app. You see, it's a slightly different uh, navigation bar. Well, we we know that we're on a tablet, so we optimize for it. There again, Wadin in combination with Quid does a good job. We don't have to rewrite the whole UI. It's uh, basically the delta that we define, and you can do neat things like. For websites and then for some events and stuff, people want to run around with a with a tablet and add some assets. So let's try to do that. I want to upload an asset. So I could select a photo. If you guys could smile now, jeez, yeah, you enjoyed the talk. It was great. Cool. Thanks a lot. So yeah, I want to use that one. Should upload in a second. Oh, cool, you say get a notification, it's uploaded, it's great. Let's save it. So this was step one. So there's one more asset in the system, and we want to use it. So I forgot, where did I want to put it? Ah, they were my favorites. Let's go to the favorite. There's a page. I want to preview that page. Mm. Oh, yeah, let's put it in there. Edit it. Now it's scrolling, okay. And that's where I want to place it. So this is a text image thing, yeah. We have an image. Select it. So this is the one we just took, yeah. Choose it. There we go. And now it's on our website, right? So. Come on, it's just scrolling. Uploaded. Let's quickly check it here. There Hi. you go. So this is just an example um, how we support on the authoring system now um, tablets. And another way, or where we support actually tablets is, um, well, as you might know, for for websites, the majority of the of the hits they get nowadays they are not done by laptops or audio learning computers, they are done by mobile devices. So um, basically most of the companies now start to serve different content depending on the device people are accessing the website. And 
for in, with many systems, what you have to do is basically define a whole new web page, which is very cumbersome. So what we we have a, a feature it's called variation. So you have your proper website, and then just define a, a variation. Let's say you call it a smartphone, and then you just define the deltas. You say, okay, if someone shows up with a with a smartphone, let me check that out. So let's say that would be our website. Nice. So desktop, you see you have a navigation up there to, to get to sub pages. And here in the upper, le um, upper right, you see there's a selection. So how would that thing look like if someone would show up uh, with a smartphone? Oh, there's no navigation there. Scroll down, scroll down, and scroll down. And actually, voila, here it is. So that's precisely the same content. The only thing that we defined is the delta, the variation. We say, oh, with a smartphone, we want to have navigation on bottom, not on top. Or you could exclude whole sections. So let me quickly exp um, demonstrate them as well. So let's say about page for whatever reason. Um, we didn't want to see that one this time on a tablet. So let's ex ex exclude it there. OK. Check out the preview for the tablet. Oof, hey. 404. But while that's expected, we said we don't want to serve it. So if someone guesses the URL, puts it in, we should get a 404. Um, so that level of differentiation is not. Sorry? That level of differentiation, yeah. desktop, tablet, uh, mobile device. Yeah. It's not really accounting for screen size differences and that kind of thing, well? Um, bigger tablets and smaller tablets. Well, the thing is, like, you could go for, I think, 10 probably variations, but then it would probably be cumbersome. So what we actually do is, well, we have these three built in. You could create your own one. But actually, this, uh, um, the layout we are using here is already customized in the sense of if, if you would, um, let me demonstrate it, if I do um, make it smaller, then the, the resources on the website will adapt anyway. So uh, it has some, there's already some logic built in. If you have a wide screen, then we show probably several columns next to each other. If you um, reduce the size, then we put in another way around. So that's, that's uh, actually something else. But you can certainly add more of those profiles. Yeah. So if you wanted to, you could target specific devices. Yeah. So to, just to quickly finish there, uh, yes, yeah, so with the tablet, you see, the we have the home, but the about thing is uh, is gone now. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think that's about it. What I want to show. So let's switch back. <coughs> you could switch back to the presentation. Okay. So that was a, just a tour about the features. Um, and let me go to um, one of the last slides. So. What if you had just taken the spring pillar? Luckily, Tobias didn't with his team. But if you had just gone for the spring approach, and it's what we see many, many times. A bunch of the fees just, I just showed you to give you an idea of if you feel like, OK, we have that web applications. And after time, this, those kind of CMS requirements, they creep in. So many people think, oh, that's easy. Well, search engine optimization, well, let's build it in. We adapt our HTML. And then later, it's um, multi-language content. We adapt it, and it's security. And it's like appetite comes while, while eating, right? So it's getting more and more and more and more features, and the effort might increase a lot. Then there's also the guys, what well, might be the, the case for some of you, where you have a CMS in-house, which is just very closed, and, and it's super hard to communica communicate. So probably that's the only way to go. So. That's why our message is basically, check it out. If, if you're lucky, if I have an influence on a system, or if you can make a choice of your CMS system, you might be very well off if you can choose one which supports Spring, because yeah, then you have the both built approach. And then you might be very efficient in implementing things. So Yeah, and you don't have to re-implement that user interface. Um, so we, we did not make the choice. We decided to take both the pills, and the project was a huge success. Um, writing this module and designing the annotation-based API, that was a lot of effort. Uh, but 
I'm convinced that the project would have been much more uh, time consuming to do if we had not done that uh, because of the, uh, de the development speed that we could get using Spring MVC and just using hard code replace to switch between them and develop it just the, the way that we we're used to do. As, as a Spring developer, I'm completely focused and my line of thinking is I'm using Spring Web MVC. This is how I want to do it. Uh, so we got all these features for free, the cool user interface. The customer could use an iPad to do fixes, uh, keep the, the website up to date. If they had a news item they wanted to enter, uh, they could just pull up that iPad, go into the user interface and add it. Um, Blossom is now open source. It's, uh, it's a module that we provide support and maintenance for. Um, in fact, after this project, um, we open sourced it. And for me personally, that was a huge success because it proved that open source can pay off because I now work for Magnolia maintaining it. And uh, it's, uh, it's used by big companies. Even the US Navy is using it. And um, one of these customers, they actually went ahead and did a Grails uh, version of this. Uh, so it's a Grails plugin called Maglev, up in the left, um, that builds on top of both Magnolia and Blossom, bundles it as a Grails plugin, and then you use these same annotations on the Grails controllers, and you get to use uh, Groovy server pages for the views. And all the cool stuff in Grails, like reloading the classes immediately and all this, that just works. So in case you're also interested in Grails, you should definitely check this out. Now, um, who has the first question? You mind the difference between FreeMarker and JSP? Free marker, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so the difference between JSP and FreeMarker is uh, JSP is XML based. So you have to do all the control logic with the JSP tags. And it's quite limited to using uh, Java beans. It wants getters and setters and it wants classes for everything. And since we have a primarily a schema less, uh, data store, there is no elegant way to do that in, the, in JSP. So you wind up with an explosion of tags. Uh, we made it a lot better by wrapping it in a Java util map, um, but you still have to do like an if else statement. You have to switch and there's an otherwise tag and all this. Free marker, on the other hand, has these things built in. And they're, it's a much shorter syntax. Um, like using one value, otherwise a default value, there's an operator for that, so it's much shorter. And yeah, then again, this limitation that it has to come from the web application archive really is not very good for a CMS which is module-based, where you would have to package it really well, it, it gets really clumsy. With free market, you can put them on the class path, edit them live from uh, your development environment, and store them in the JCR if you need to change them.
So what you can do if you have the images and the resources coming from different things, but you want to make them uh, easily usable from the user interface, I guess. You could either import them, but then you would have to continuously import them in order to keep them up to date. Um, so these fields that we showed you are implemented in, in Vadin, and you could uh, create a custom such field and use that, and that field would pull it in or uh, expose it in the user interface. Uh, and then I think I would have like a JSP tag or a free market thing where I would um, output a reference to it in the view. Um, I think that's how, how I do, the, do it. As far as I know, like the MVC customer, they don't host uh, those big streams in our system. They have super high performance uh, stream services and they embed it and put it in the page. Right, for the TV channels, Yeah, yeah. TV programs. Absolutely. Yeah. So in the um, XML file for this dispatcher servlet, um, there is a number of a number of view resolvers. Uh, the first one is for JSP, then for FreeMarker. And if you wanted to use Timeleaf, you would just add it in and configure it so that it would uh, match what you're returning from the controllers. And you could re render anything that way. I mean really any type of view. Uh, what's special about the one that the ones that comes with Blossom is that you get this content object dropped in a map in your JSPs. Uh, so that stuff I think I would copy if I wanted to do a timely view resolver to make it behave the same. Well standard J well, JSP EL yeah. More questions? Okay, cool. So, <laughs> cool. Um, the, the publishing event that occurs yeah. between your authoring environment yeah. and your published prod environment, um, are, are there ways to plug in additional things? For example, we, we were heavy Akamai. What, yeah. what we internally use is a uh, things called commands. So we delegate it to commands, and you could create your custom commands and configure the system to say, okay, I use that command. Command could chain other commands. So you would actually in your command you would chain that activation thing and add other commands you want to inform that system. You want to send out an email on the same time, stuff like that. It's easily doable. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, the the behavior from application point of view is still the same. You have all the query thing, observation, what I said, like uh, the locking. That's always there. It's transparent, right? The, the user won't realize that you configured it. And you can actually split it. Like, we split our data in so-called workspaces, image assets, uh, websites, configuration, whatever. You could configure per workspace, say, the, my assets, they shouldn't be on the file system. It's probably more efficient whereas all the rest should reside in a database. So what's important to note there is that the, uh, the JCR is clustered on every machine, so it doesn't need to have transactional support from the file system. Mm. Instead, there is only one process mm. accessing the data on the file system, so it, there's no uh, need for coordinating transactions between processes. Nothing more? Len? I guess we're done. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs> if there's further questions, we have a table down in the in the hall. You can ask us any time. There's a final slide here with some online resources.
Glad if you can check it out. Thanks a lot.